Welcome back to ASTR, the video magazine that brings together the best of the Seventh-day Adventist Church's past and present in order to inspire for the future. In this episode, Dr. Michael Yunker, ASTR's historical research specialist, brings us the events of This Week in Adventist History. Then he joins me to bring you another moving and inspiring story from the Encyclopedia of Seventh-day Adventists. Next, Ashley Chisholm, our Research Center Manager, shares about the recent donation to the archives of the papers of much-loved former General Conference President Robert H. Pearson. Finally, Maggie Nehra, the editor of the Seventh-day Adventist Yearbook, shares statistics about the Adventist Church's organizations and institutions. You will be surprised at how large the church is and how many institutions it has. But first, we turn to the past and to this week in Adventist history. This week in Adventist history, we remember one of our former General Conference presidents, George I. Butler, who passed away on July 25, 1918. He served as president from 1871 to 74, and again from 1880 to 1888. While it is true he had a strong will and personality, which occasionally caused tensions within the church, he was also a passionate about advancing the cause, especially the publishing ministry and foreign missions, and was also gifted at managing institutions and organizations, helping establish our first college in Battle Creek, Michigan in 1874. Married to Lintha Lockwood, the couple had three children, Annie, William, and his twin, Hilland. While in Europe in 1884, he laid the groundwork for the publishing houses in Basel, Switzerland, Christiana, or Oslo, Norway, and Grimsby, England. His efforts in Europe greatly helped the Adventist cause expand there. After 1888, Butler retired to Florida and planted an orange grove. Later, following the death of his first wife, Lintha Lockwood, in 1901, he again served as president, this time of the Florida Conference and later the Southern Union Conference and also the Southern Publishing Association before his final retirement. At that time, he also married Elizabeth Granger, the widow of William Granger, and they enjoyed their retirements together before Butler passed away. And for another quick window into the earliest days of our Advent pioneers, on July 26, 1843, Charles Fitch printed his sermon on the mighty angel who cried, Babylon the Great is fallen, with the warning, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. It was these passages from Revelation 14 and 18 that Fitch believed could be applied not only to the ancient Roman church, but also the greater body of modern Protestantism. Both had become cold to the reality of the Second Advent or spiritualized it away. His beliefs would become commonly accepted in the Seventh-day Adventist movement some years later. That was This Week in Adventist History. Are you excited to hear another story from the Encyclopedia of Seventh-day Adventists? Today's ESDA story is about two of the earliest Adventist missionaries to Spain, the brothers Frank and Walter Bond. You can freely access this story and 4,000 other articles at encyclopedia.adventist.org. Frank and Walter Bond were two of the 11 children of farmers, James and Sarah Bond, who accepted the Adventist message in the early days of Adventism sometime around 1870. On the screen you can see the Bond family. Frank is the tallest in the back row and Walter is on his left side. Frank and Walter both graduated from Healdsburg College, the forerunner of today's Pacific Union College in 1899. After graduation, the two brothers went to Phoenix to sell Adventist books to the Spanish-speaking population of the region. The decisive event that set them on a missionary path was the California camp meeting in Fresno from September 30th to October 12th, 1902. The keynote for the meetings was foreign missions, and when an appeal was made for missionaries to work in Spain, Frank and Walter both volunteered. They sailed for Europe on November 26, about six weeks after the camp meetings ended, and less than two weeks after Walter and his fiancée, Leola, were wed. Progress was made almost immediately. 
The day after arriving in Barcelona, they called on a gentleman who had shown some interest in the efforts of earlier missionary B.G. Wilkinson. Within days, they began Bible studies with him, and he soon declared that he would keep the Sabbath. This same gentleman had previously been an evangelical Protestant worker, and having a little flock in Sabadell, about 15 miles from Barcelona, he invited Walter and Frank to come and share the message with them. The brothers accepted and reported, the only way a place can be secured to be used for religious purposes is to rent it for school work. For this reason, and also because we thought it would enable us to enter homes, we decided to carry on a little school in connection with the meetings. The school began with 19 boys. As a result of these early efforts, the first three Adventist baptisms were performed in Spain by B.G. Wilkinson on June 29, 1904. In the following years, Frank and Walter moved with their families to different regions. Frank chose Valencia as his base camp and Walter chose Barcelona. The photo on the screen shows the Bond brothers with their families, Walter and Leola on the left and Frank and his wife Martha on the right. Although they worked separately now, they continued to support each other and results followed. They were able to report 23 baptized members in Spain at the General Conference Committee Council in Gland, Switzerland in 1907. However, progress was made in difficult circumstances. In the May 16, 1907 issue of the Adventist Review, Walter wrote about civil unrest in Barcelona at the time and his near-death experience when a bomb exploded only about 20 yards from the place where he was standing. Four persons were fatally wounded and a score of others were badly injured. When these things began to take place about us, Walter wrote, the Master commands us to look up and lift our heads for our redemption draweth nigh. They were pressed by other challenges too. From the beginning of their missionary work, they were faced with illiteracy throughout the population and the opposition of the Catholic Church's priests. Walter wrote about his work in Beza, It has been a continual warfare with the priesthood. Ignorance, superstition, priests and fanaticism abound, making it probably the most difficult place that we have thus far entered. But even here, we have hope. In the fall of 1910, the Adventist Church in Spain held its first general meeting with 39 of its 65 members in attendance at 40 Mercadores Street in Barcelona. The following year, the annual meeting was held in late September 1911 with Ludwig R. Conradi, the leader of Adventist work in Europe, present. The church membership was 90. It was in Beza that Walter became gravely ill in 1914. He telegraphed Frank on November 1st to come to Beza because he was impressed his illness was fatal. Although the family employed the best medical help available, Walter sadly died on November 12th after spending almost 12 years in Spain. Although his death certificate states peritonitis as the cause, his daughter Elsa later revealed, when we left Spain, the doctor told my mother that Walter had been poisoned. By all indications, it had been administered through his daily milk by a dairy farmer. On his deathbed, according to family tradition, he forgave his executioners. Frank, pictured with his family in the photo, moved to Beza several months after his brother's death to minister to those who had made decisions for Christ under Walter's influence. Years later, sometime between 1943 and 1945, a terrible incident took place when Walter Bond's tomb was desecrated and his bones disappeared. On April 30, 2009, Jose Rodriguez Camara wrote an article for the local newspaper, Diario de Heyen, with the help of Pastor Daniel Posse. This article was read by a non-Adventist professor at the University of Seville, who contacted the Director of Archives for the Spanish Union, Pastor Andres Tejel, which in turn led to a meeting with the Mayor of Beza and a restoration of Walter's tomb. On Sunday, May 23, 2010, at noon, in the Municipal Cemetery of Beza, a public ceremony was held honoring Walter's life with a new plaque attended by the Mayor of Beza and the President of the Spanish Union of Seventh-day Adventists, among others. Thus, almost 100 years after his death, Walter received public recognition in the city where he sacrificed his life for the gospel. Frank Bond became the President of the Spanish Mission of Seventh-day Adventists. In 1921, he was on a short furlough in the United States when this photo of him was taken at the Arlington camp meeting. 
Frank is seated on the far right. Frank Bonn returned to Spain and worked there until 1923. When exhausted from work and in poor health, he permanently returned to the United States. After more than two decades of service in Spain, he died in Fresno, California on April 25, 1924. The story of the Bond brothers is a story of dedication and resilience in the face of adversity. We invite you to read the whole stories about Frank and Walter Bond and many other Adventist missionaries in the Encyclopedia of Seventh-day Adventists at encyclopedia.adventist.org. That's encyclopedia.adventist.org. As Robert H. Pearson made the surprise announcement that he would retire from the role of General Conference President, a photographer took a photo of Pearson from behind and slightly to his left, with Pearson in the right corner of the image and the attendees to the 1978 Annual Council to the left and in the background. Pearson is speaking into a microphone, his left hand lightly under a page of his speech's outline, held securely in a small three-ring notebook. The General Conference Archives recently received a donation from Pearson's son of materials created by Robert H. Pearson throughout his career, including manuscripts, transcripts, articles, and multiple notebooks containing sermon outlines and notes, just like the one in the photograph. These materials now form the Robert H. Pearson Collection. The next step for the materials is for them to be archively processed. Now, why do they need to be archively processed? because new archival materials do not typically arrive neatly organized. This is the step of the process that the Pearson Collection is presently on. Here you can see some of the materials from the Pearson Collection after they were removed from the boxes they were shipped in. You can see that there are quite a number of notebooks in these two stacks, some bearing intriguing titles such as How to Be a Successful Christian Leader, Evangelistic Sermons, Itineraries 1974 to 1980, and Council on the Role of Women too. The documents inside the notebooks will be housed in archival quality folders. The folders will be put into boxes and the boxes will be assigned storage locations. During this process, an inventory is also made of the materials, either at the box level, the folder level, or the item level. Typically, we process archival collections at the folder level, but since Pearson was a general conference president and the bulk of the collection is sermon outlines, most of his collection is being processed at an item level. This means that we are capturing each outline's title while also taking note of the binder it was originally in and any other useful data. Why are we processing it at this level? Well, when the collection is done being processed, it will be open to researchers, and the collection will also have a finding aid. This finding aid, you see here a possible title page for this collection's finding aid, will contain information about the collection which can introduce the collection to a researcher and give them an idea of what they may see when working with the collection during an in-person visit to the archives. Just seeing a long list of folders titled Sermon Outlines would not be very helpful. Since the outlines cover Pearson's entire career, both pre- and post-GC presidency, they perhaps can give us insight into how he thought and wrote and what themes interested him the most. Elected as General Conference President in June 1966, Pearson kept both himself and his pen in motion. Although many of the outlines are undated, some are easy to point out as having been written during his presidency, sometimes because he wrote the outlines on the reverse side of his presidential letterhead. He is probably best remembered today for his emphasis on revival and reformation, and there are sermon outlines reflecting that emphasis, including one simply titled, Time for Revival. Yet there is more to Pearson and to his presidency than his emphasis on revival and reformation. Three things have become prominent in the inventory process. First, Christ and the gospel were clearly central to Pearson's ministry, including his presidency. Second, learning from the past and planning for the future were key priorities for Pearson as general conference president. Not only did he actively engage in reshaping administrative and organizational structures of the church during his administration, but he also considered how the changing world was affecting the church with titles like The Church, Past, Present, and Future, and The Church in a Decade of Decision. Third, improving relationships between Adventists of varying ethnic and national backgrounds was something about which Pearson was adamant. 
usually addressed at those Adventists whose attitudes and actions were less than Christ-like. Pearson wrote and gave sermons and talks like, let us reason together and what shall my attitude be? He emphasized that being Christian and being Adventist should unify the church and allow no room for bigotry to exist within the church. One of the first things he shared with the church as its president was this statement of his. This family is not a North American family or a South American family or a European or an Asian or an African family. Seventh-day Adventists are not nationalists. We are internationalists. Ours is a worldwide program. We have the same devotion, the same commission, the same goal. We are all headed Zionward. And I am glad that we have the blessed assurance in the word of God that that goal is going to be reached. The Robert H. Pearson Collection will allow light to be shed on a pivotal figure in Adventist history. And the General Conference Archives is absolutely thrilled to have received this rich trove of materials. We look forward to the scholarship that will come from use of this collection. Welcome to a new statistical nugget from the ASTR Data Collection and Publication Team. For this episode, we will identify the types and number of organizational units and institutions listed in the 2023 Seventh-day Adventist Yearbook. The Seventh-day Adventist Yearbook lists all Adventist organizations and institutions around the world, from general conference divisions, unions and conferences, to educational institutions, food industries, healthcare institutions, and more. The 2023 Seventh-day Adventist Yearbook lists the 946 organizational units distributed in one general conference, 13 divisions, 139 unions, 429 conferences, 323 missions, fields, and sections, 36 local regions, and five local field stations. And finally, there are four organizational units attached directly to the general conference, three unions and one field. As for institutions, the 2023 Seventh-day Adventist Yearbook lists the following. 675 educational institutions, which include accredited universities, colleges, mid-level educational institutions, and full secondary schools. 16 food industries. Under healthcare, 194 hospitals and sanitariums, 302 clinics and dispensaries, three mobile clinics, one air base, four health education and lifestyle centers, 79 nursing homes and retirement centers, 24 orphanages and children's homes, six healthcare corporations in the North American division. In addition to Hope Channel International, 19 media centers, 60 publishing houses, 131 radio and TV stations plus Adventist World Radio, two miscellaneous institutions, and one risk management institution. Each year, the number of organizational units and institutions listed in the yearbook may increase due to the creation of new entities or obtained and renewed accreditations or denominational status by institutions. The number of entities in a category may also diminish because of mergers or the expiration of accreditations. Furthermore, types of entities may be adjusted because there is a change to their status. The yearbook is available for consultation online at www.adventistyearbook.org and through the Adventist Yearbook app. Information on how to get the yearbook app for your mobile devices can be found by going to the yearbook website and scrolling to the bottom where you will find a link that will direct you to the App Store. You can also go directly to the App Store of your mobile device and search for Adventist Yearbook. In addition, the most recent yearbook on paperback or PDF format can be purchased at www.pacificpress.com slash SDA yearbook. To find more information on the Adventist Yearbook, visit www.adventistyearbook.com Dot org. That's adventistyearbook.org. Thank you for watching the latest episode of ASTR. We're so glad you were able to join us. 
If you've enjoyed this episode, please like and subscribe on YouTube, and please let your friends know about it. And please look for us on Facebook and Twitter. Just search for Adventist Archives. Join us again next time as we share information and inspiration from Adventist history and today.